Today is December 14th, 2009. I am Karen Aronson. We are talking with Robert Langer, one of MIT's 14 institute professors and the award-winning head of the Langer Laboratory, which works at the interface of biotechnology and materials science. A prolific inventor with some 750 issued and pending patents worldwide, his breakthrough discoveries have been critical in controlled drug delivery, tissue engineering, and the battle against cancer. Some of his findings are also being used to make frizzy hair straight and to try to help Julie Andrews sing again using synthetic vocal cords. Professor Langer, thank you for talking with us today. Where do your ideas come from? Do you wake up every morning with ideas fighting to get out? Well, ideas come from all over the place. I mean, I've gotten ideas watching television. I've gotten ideas listening to music. I've gotten ideas listening to lectures. Sometimes I get a group of students and postdocs together, you know, because I have a specific idea, and a general idea in mind, and we just do brainstorming to come up with things. So they, they really, there's, there's no single place, but, uh, you know, I think they just kind of happen. Do they come in a steady stream or ebb and flow? And do you have as many now as you did when you started or more? Uh, I'd, say, I'd say they don't come in a steady stream. <laughs> they, they, they do probably just come, you know, from different stimuli. Uh, and I think they probably do, you know, I, and, and they don't just come from me. I mean, one of my, the things that's very important to me is to make sure that that, that, that the laboratory that I run, which has a lot of students, undergraduate students, graduate students, and postdocs, I, I, I want them to feel like they can invent, that they can come up with ideas. So I think, I, so my hope is that whatever I do and, 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 and the way I sort of work in the lab uh, with the different people there gets people to feel free to, you know, have their own ideas. And sometimes really good ideas have come from my students as well. Among all your discoveries and patents, do you have a favorite? Or people people sometimes <laughs> ask that question. So, sometimes I give an answer that, like, uh, that, you know, when they ask about my children, uh, do I have a favorite? And, 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 and so, in a way, I, I, I love all of them. Uh, if I were to pick, I suppose one of the discoveries we made, uh, actually now over 30 years ago, in controlled drug delivery, people used to think, the conventional wisdom was that you could only um, deliver molecules that were very, very tiny through plastics. And we worked out a way to change the structure of plastics so that you could deliver molecules of any size. And I, and I like to think that that had a profound effect on the field. And today, in fact, many, all kinds of molecules are put in these kinds of plastics and it's led to many new treatments for cancer, heart disease, and many other diseases. Also, it, it would lead to new bioassays for uh, substances that could, could stop cancer blood vessels from growing and other things. So I suppose that, that uh, discovery, which we published in Nature and patented now back in 1976, was actually the original paper in Nature, uh, you know, is certainly one that I, I, I feel proud of. But I, 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 I like all of them. <laughs> The one you were describing was in the Judah Folkman lab, and it do you remember? It was. Yeah. Do you it remember was. how how you dived in and, and how that came to you? Well, it was kind of empirical. I mean, what I sometimes say when I give lectures is I I, I found over two hundred ways to get it to not work. I, I experimented <laughs> with. Uh, all kinds of methods of making microparticles and polymer systems, and most of them didn't work. Eventually, I found a way to get it to work. But at the time, I don't think we fully understood why it worked. It was a, a number of years later that we got more into the mechanisms of it and, and figured out why it worked and uh, had to do with building in very intricate porous pathways uh, and, and, and tortuous pathways in, into the plastics. But um, but basically, it was just a lot of hard work and, and uh, brainstorming and empiricism. Partly tenacity, then. Yeah, I, I think so. I'm, I'm a very stubborn person, and I, I probably don't give up very easily. And it was very important to me to solve that because it also related not just to helping that problem, but working with Judah Folkman, one of my big... Uh, goals and one of the things I was trying to do was to develop a bioassay for studying 
how what we call angiogenesis inhibitors, substances that could stop blood vessel growth, and there were no assays then. So if we couldn't develop plastics that could deliver these molecules, which all these angiogenesis inhibitors were large molecules, then we couldn't have solved that. And I'm glad we did. I mean, today the whole field of angiogenesis has become a, a, a very large and important area. At the front end, did you think it was going to be possible and it was just a matter of figuring it out? Or, or did you go in saying, hmm, I don't know? I'm an optimist, I, you know, and so I guess I believe that it would be possible. You know, I mean, I, I think then and I think now that most things are possible. Sometimes you don't know how long <clears throat> it'll take to, uh, to do them, but I, I, I like to think that things are, most things are possible. Can you convey that optimism or teach it to, to students and, and postdocs? Is that something that, that you, you see as part of the education of a young scientist or engineer? I think that you can convey it in certain ways. I think from a role model standpoint, you can convey it. And I think, I think the people in the lab in particular, you know, they see what happens there and they see their colleagues or me and, you know, do, doing things and, 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 and solving problems. And, and I, I also think you can do it as a mentor in terms of what I call positive reinforcement, you know, encouraging people. Uh, so, so I do, I think, I don't think you can teach it, but I think you can help. And mm -hmm. I think that in the different ways I mentioned, I think I, I try to help. What are some of the things you're working on now? Well, we're working on a number of things now. One big area is nanotechnology. We're working on creating nanoparticles that could uh, specifically target anti-cancer drugs to tumors or, or other uh, or, or other or other disease uh, tissues. We're working on uh, nanoparticles that can deliver uh, new kinds of drugs like uh, RNA, R, what are called, say, RNA silencing molecules uh, to cells. We're also doing a lot of work on what I'll call regenerative, regenerative medicine. We're working on trying to come up with uh, new strategies to create, um, say, well, really, really any um, uh, tissue or organ by combining cells, including stem cells, with the right kind of plastic or polymer. And that could include and does include everything from making new kinds of pancreases uh, for, for diabetics to uh, new spinal cords for people who are paralyzed and, and, and many other diseases as well. And how close are you to doing uh, some of these things? Uh, what kind of progress are you? Well, what, what's happened, if I, if I look at the nanotechnology, we'll be starting a clinical trial in 2010, uh, I believe, to uh, try to treat uh, prostate cancer. Uh, so that'll be a, a very exciting uh, time because it'll have moved the work that we started into the clinic, and that's how you really begin to know just how well it'll work. Um, some of the others are in, in, in animal stages, and, and uh, uh, so you know, with, with the, where the testing has been promising, and, and so I'm, I'm ho I, so I feel like we're making good progress. But you always want to move faster. <laughs> How do you define what you want to go after? In other words, there are so many yeah. open questions, and and you have such certain skills and and. Uh, yeah. Ideas. Well, I guess what I always try to think about is what can we do with our skills and with our people that can make the biggest impact on the world, and 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 you know, and then you sort of look at all the ideas you have and 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 ask and ask that question. I mean, which 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 of these things do you feel will make the biggest impact, and and you go after those. Are there lots of people going after these same questions? One one hears sometimes about races in science yeah. and. Uh, do you tend to um, be affected by that phenomenon at all? Do you, do you then, does it drive you, or, or do you avoid things where lots of other people are, are racing? Well, I, I think that, well, I mean, a lot of times I've gone into areas where, at least as, I think engineering sometimes, races are a little bit different than biology. I think biology, like there have been races for DNA structure and things like that, and engineering, I think, it's 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 less so you know you, you're not because you're not making a fundamental discovery of a structure I mean you're often trying to create or invent something uh, and and I would say at least in my case a lot of the things that I've tried to invent or come up with 
haven't been things that the, sometimes the world or many other scientists thought were possible. So it wasn't like we had competition. Uh, you know, in fact, I, a lot of times when I did some of these studies, people were skeptical about them in the beginning. And, 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 and so I think that, uh, that I haven't had that, you know, race in the same way. That being said, I mean, now I think there are over 200 of my own students or, or postdocs or professors at other schools, and they are working in these areas, and other people are working in them too. And so I think that uh, these areas have grown a lot since I started working in them now some 35 years ago. And, and I think, I mean, to, and to me, that's good. I mean, I, I want to see that happen because I want to see these fields grow and change, and, and I want to see bioengineering become something that's, you know, that's, that's really important to the world. And so if there is competition, if more people are working on these things, I mean, personally, I think that's a, that's a good thing. And earlier this year, Nature chronicled a day in your life, and it was a nonstop whirlwind from about 6.15 in the morning to nearly midnight. Um, it included exercise and reviewing grant proposals and meeting with students and faculty and teaching and constant emailing and even time with your family. Oh, and a frozen coffee chip <laughs> yogurt with hot fudge sauce. Was that a typical day? Uh, it's, it's, it's atypical day. I mean, you know, uh, there are other typical days, too. I mean, I, I asked uh, Helen Pearson, who was the writer, I said, uh, you know, another type of typical day is I'd be getting on an airplane and uh, traveling somewhere, and I think that's something else you'd do. Right. But if I'm in Boston, uh, which, which are probably more typical days than getting on airplanes, I think that month I had to travel, uh, I had five airplane trips, and I think two were overseas in, in, in that month. Uh, but so, so that's one type of typical day, um, but you know sometimes um, getting on an airplane and, and uh, is is another typical day, and so so there are different types of days. I mean, and you know, and sometimes uh, it, it it could be uh, you know I, I I might be at a conference or something like that, and so um, either in Boston or elsewhere, and, and and that might be another kind of typical day. But if I'm at MIT, that day was so. Uh, which, which I am most of the time, that's probably the, the most typical day. How do you find time to think on a day like that? Well, I think you get ideas all over the place, you know? I mean, you get ideas, and, and one of the things that you mentioned is, you know, I'm exercising, I'm reading. So actually, I exercise a lot, and whenever I exercise, I, uh, I, I have reading material, or I have the TV on, or music on, or, or all of the above. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes, like I say, ideas just come to you. Other times you're talking to students and postdocs and you're brainstorming with them. So I think when she visited me, you know, there were lots of different meetings, people from, you know, un undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs, you know, visitors, um, all types of people. Even even uh, that afternoon, I think there was a under, you know, one of the things I did is we have a Europe program, and I think I had about uh, 30 to 40 uh, undergraduates for this, like, pizza get-together, and, you know, they're asking all kinds of questions, so, <laughs> which is great. I mean, so I think that, that, that idea is you have lots of times to, you know, where they just kind of happen. Do you have fun with your work? Oh, I love it. I mean, I, uh, I, 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 you know, if I, I, I really don't even think about it as work. I mean, if I had to, you know, it's amazing that you can have a job like this where you can get to work <laughs> with fascinating people, like invent things, do things to help people, you know, travel every day if you want to. I mean, I don't want yeah. to, but, you know, and, I mean, but, you know, to wherever you want in the world, I mean, it's, it's a just, it's a fantastic, um, you know, it's, to me, this is a fantastic opportunity, a fantastic job. Do you do you run into people who don't seem to have so much fun, or, or or does everybody in your field? And and again, is this something you can teach people if if they don't seem to get it? I think I think there's a couple things that real that I would, I guess I'd go over. One time, I I think I think one of the things that's hard for people in academics, one of the biggest things that's always sort of a big driver in terms of not having fun, is probably raising money. You know, I think that that's. You know, and so I think some people get discouraged because they have a hard time raising money. Um, and, and I think that's probably the biggest single negative to being a professor, at least at a lot of places. Uh, I suppose other things that could have effects on them feeling that way are, you know, pressure. I mean, you know, pressure to publish, pressure to, um, you know, 
do different kinds of things. Um, and then I suppose it's just really somebody's personal outlook, how they view the world. You know, are they glass optimist or pessimist? Is the glass half full or is it half empty? Uh, but yeah, there are a number uh, a number of people who who, who uh, you know aren't, aren't aren't probably as happy, and there are other people who are probably very happy. I think you can try to teach some things if it's if it's if it has to do with grants. You know, I like to think that when somebody comes through our lab, we you know I, I have everybody help and pitch in, and I go I I try to encourage the postdocs, for example, to write postdoctoral fellowships. Not. Uh, for you know, for a variety of reasons. First, it's an honor. Secondly, it's some funding. But third, I think they, that gives them a taste of, of of writing grants, and I can try to help them with that. And uh, so I think that, and and actually, even some of the many of the people who leave our lab, you know, their first couple of years when they're starting, and and even later, I've gone over their grants and tried to tr review them and give them suggestions. So I I, I, I want to see them do well. So yeah, I think that uh, there are there are some things you can teach and help with. Let's talk about the path that brought you to MIT. Um, starting from where were you born? Where did you grow up? What were you like as a child? I grew up in Albany, New York. Um, I don't think I was anything that unusual as a child. <laughs> I, I, you know, my dad and my grandfather played a lot of math games with me, and I think that got me interested in math. And I was pretty good in math as a as a as a child, and they also, uh, when I was a little older, like ten or eleven, I got like this Gilbert chemistry set, and I think a Gilbert microscope set, and I liked those kinds of things to play around with, and I think that that helped me, you know, get excited about science more than I might have otherwise. Um, but I had a pretty normal childhood. I, I, you know, really grew up in a small house in Albany, New York, and uh, it was it was fine. And then I was a when I got done, I really didn't have a very clear idea of what engineering was, but I, my um, guidance counselor and dad said, if you're good in math and science, that's what you should major in, and I had no idea uh, what else to do. Anyhow, I, I, I went to Cornell as an undergraduate. I, uh, again, my first year, I, I didn't, uh, some of the courses were hard for me. Chemistry was the thing I liked the best and was best at, so I, how to decide after a year what I was going to major in, so I picked chemical engineering. Uh, and I studied that, and when I got done being an undergraduate, I, again, really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Uh, so I figured I'd go to graduate school. And, and that took me, I applied to a number of places, and I came here to MIT as, as, as a graduate student. Were you in the engineering school at Cornell? I was, So yes. you had gone in directly because people said you might like it or be good at it. Right. At Cornell, you had to pick a different school. So different. So right. I, 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 I had picked engineering, yes. Because the, the question of liking chemistry, but, but you didn't choose chemistry. You chose the chemical engineering. Right. So I wasn't, so there, there was, at Cornell, they had a school of arts and sciences, and they had a school of engineering. There's actually about 10 schools. Right. And, uh, but I had, I had chosen the engineering school to begin with, so it wasn't like I could have been a chem major. Uh -huh. uh, you know, it wasn't part of the engineering school. Did you have people in your family who were in science or engineering? I mean, even the fact that they were playing, that, that your father yeah. and grandfather were playing math games with you suggests that maybe they were in fields that were related? They weren't. I mean, they were very smart people, but my dad, uh, you know, ran uh, a, like a liquor store for a, a good part of his life. My grandfather worked in a, or his father worked in a brush factory. I think uh, my mom's dad worked in a clothes store. So they, um, but, that, but so, but I think they were, you know, very intelligent people. I mean, my dad would do the New York Times crossword puzzle all the time and do it pretty quickly. Uh, I'm sure I couldn't do it. <laughs> and and they were, uh, you know, he he. It, there's a different time. I mean, my dad uh, actually went to Harvard for a master's degree in uh, English, and but he got out in the Great Depression. I think he said there were two jobs he could have taken. One was in North Dakota, and the other probably someplace not not that different. And. Uh, you know, so he didn't do that, you know, and, and ultimately went into the war and uh, came out and married my mom. But I think that, uh, you know, it was a very different time in history uh, compared to where we live in today. But it, did he play word games with you, too? It's interesting that he was playing math games with you, and, yeah. and even though he had been an English Yes, yeah. Uh, he, didn't, at, at he, he, didn't, he didn't play word games with me, no. At least not that I remember. I remember the math. They, but they were very good at uh, both he and my grandfather at playing math games with me. Did you have a favorite math game? 
I think I would just like, you know, I think when I was little I could count higher than most people and I could add up things, you know, so sometimes uh -huh. it was just how, you know, if, how, how high could you add something up and, how, you know, but I could do that at a pretty young age. You mentioned that you weren't sure what you wanted to do, so you figured you'd keep going in graduate school and yeah. applied to a number. Why MIT? And uh... well, MIT, I you know MIT as uh, graduate school, I, I I think there were a couple of things. One, I think probably was the best, and 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 uh, or, or at least close to the best. But secondly, I remember when I looked at the chemi program at, at MIT in 1970. When I was uh, when I came here, one of the things that appealed to me is since I didn't know what I wanted to do, MIT's chemical engineering program at that time seemed very diverse to me. It had uh, applied chemistry, it had polymer chemistry, it had uh, bioengineering a little bit, you know. So so it seemed more diverse to me than um, most of the other departments that I was uh, looking at, and that had appealed to me since I wasn't really clear on what I wanted to do. Did you, and what were your first reactions when you got to MIT? And, I mean, you were in a very different place from Ithaca, I guess. Yeah. Uh, well, one, I guess a couple things. One, Boston was a lot more expensive. I remember that because uh, I, I remember, like, I think I um, paid $60 a month for my apartment at, at uh, Cornell, and I had a pretty nice apartment. And then when I came to MIT, I think I was getting a stipend of $240 a month, and I thought I'd get this mansion. And I remember <laughs> coming up with one of my friends from Cornell, because he was also going to be at MIT, and we looked at apartments, and we couldn't believe how expensive it was. Uh, so we didn't get any mansion. <laughs> but, uh, but secondly, it, it was hard. MIT was hard, you know, it was uh, hard, hard as a first-year graduate student. Um, but uh, yeah, so those were a couple of the early impressions I had. You actually did some things besides uh, chemical engineering. You were active in community service then. I, some graduate students seem to make their whole life their, their graduate work, but um, that wasn't the way you went about it. No, I, I, I um, when I, of course this was the late 60s and early 70s, but, and I think a lot of people were, you know, interested in maybe doing, or at least some people were interested in doing things broader than just uh, uh, their, their, their school work at MIT. For me, I, I, uh, when I was an undergraduate at Cornell, I was a teaching assistant my senior year, and I loved that. So when I came to MIT, I was trying to figure out ways also that I could help people and maybe use some of my skills, and I really enjoyed the teaching very much. So I, I uh, helped uh, do tutoring both in Roxbury, and there was a place called the Education Warehouse in Cambridge. I got involved with MIT's uh, Urban Action and uh, got different teaching things through there. Then I got involved with helping start a school called the Group School in Cambridge, and and I spent uh, several years doing that. In fact, had the Math and Science department, and I even um, got MIT involved in, var in various ways, both by having a, a variety of programs here where students from the school would work in the labs and where we developed new chemistry curricula and things like that. So I, it was a, I think a, it was a, I, I spent an awful lot of time doing that, but I, I loved it. And your teachers, your professors didn't discourage you? Well, it's an interesting <laughs> question. I'm not sure for a while that my professors knew how, how much time I was spending on that. <laughs> but um, I think, I think that, uh, they might have had they really known how much time I was spending, but I also spent a good deal of time. I were, you know, my I I was doing two <laughs> things. I'd either work in the lab or I'd be, you know, doing the tutoring or, or being at the school. So I, uh, um, you know, and, and when I worked in the lab, it was often late at night, and so the my particular professor was around late at night. So if he saw me working late at night, and so I, I guess I was able to to do both. You ran very long days then, too, it sounds like. I guess I've always <laughs> ran very long days. I guess that's my life, but I like it that way. Do you still do anything along those lines? Are you involved in um, high school or uh, pre-college education? Or I do to a certain extent. I give a lot of lectures. At, I mean, for a professor, I guess, I give quite a few lectures at high schools. And uh, so I, I, I have done that, and, and we have had uh, high school students work in the lab. 
Uh, so I, 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 I certainly do some, I'm, and I really feel it's important for, I mean, I've even lectured in, in grammar schools, but I, I, I feel it's important to try to communicate. I think, you know, that science can really be a good thing, and, and so, uh, so, yeah, I do. Do you have thoughts? There, there are lots of um, concerns that not enough American students go into math and science and engineering. Do you think there's anything we can do about it? Do you, would you, if you could wave a wand, what would you do? Well, I think there's probably a lot we can do about, or that the nation could do about it. But I think that the, um, I, I guess if I could wave a wand, I would think of a couple things. One, I think it, it would be, I think, very important for the government to, to uh, put more funding into, you know, high school and grammar school education and science. I think that that would be be really valuable, and I think, you know, there's specific things that they could be done. I also think the media, um, and maybe there could be some ways to contribute funding to that, but I think the media glorifies, you know, actors and sports heroes and singers, and they don't glorify science very much. And I think that that's, uh, so I think the message that young children often get is that science isn't very important, and particularly, you know, they're watching TV or, you know, or on the computer or whatever. I mean, I think science. Is, so I, th I think those two areas, you know, edu you know, uh, grammar school and high school education on the one hand, and media on the other hand, are probably two of the big forces that could could really help. You said if there were more federal money, there were certain things that one could do. Yes. Like, such as uh, well, I think you could put more money into you know developing innovative curricula. I think you could, you know, you could probably. I mean, again, I, I think it's almost unlimited. Probably what you could do. I mean, you might w want to put together some panels to to really look at this carefully. But it would seem to me, and you know, and come up with a list of priorities. But I think public school teachers could get higher salaries. I think. Uh, I mean, I think that. Uh, you know, you could come up with new innovative laboratory things. I mean, maybe you could even create some opportunities for media and, um, you know, to do a, a, a better job on science. You know, maybe you could put more money into science museums or other things like that. I think mm -hmm. you one might make more interesting kind of science games. Uh, I, I think it's almost unlimited the kinds of things that you could, you know, better yeah. te television shows that, uh, that uh, you know, make science exciting in different ways. I mean, you know, a lot of these would take, would be challenging, but I'm sure they could all be done. You know, but right. a lot of times, you know, when uh, people, uh, you know, if, 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 the, if there's funding, uh, then I, I, you could do all kinds of things. I suppose other things could be funding to help uh, universities uh, interact with high schools or grammar schools. I mean, to me, it's, it's, you know, you could go on and on with the kinds of things that could be done that I think would, would help education mm -hmm. for young people. Some of the challenge would seem to be getting enough role models who are interested in these areas, if not at home. In other words, if you don't grow up in a house where you right. play math games, as That's right. families, if many MIT kids do, I think, um, and you get to a classroom where the teacher seems to recoil from math or science instead of getting really excited about it, how do you begin to find the people who will convey that excitement and move them into the schools or? Well, I, I completely agree with you, and, I, and that, that's why one of the things that I was saying is, is again, if you, yeah. if you put more funding into it, you know, then you could probably give fellowships for people yeah. to, you know, study math education. You know, you, you could just lower the bar to get more people in to science or math education. And, and, and so, um, on the one hand, you could get more people who would be more role models. On the other hand, you could have curriculum development done yeah. That would, you know, make it more exciting for those people and others, and 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 you could try to create, you know, curricula that would be exciting for people at any age. And I think that those kinds of things would be really valuable. I know when I uh, taught at the group school, and I, I was the first math teacher there, and I remember, you know, that was a, a very liberal school, so their policy was that you would only had to take math if you wanted to, you not because you had to. And I think the first year I came, five people out of thirty-seven. Uh, took it, and then. The set, but I spent a lot of time trying to think how to make it interesting, and and came up with different kinds of math games myself. So the second year, 45 out of 50 people took it, and so I think that there are things that can certainly be done. 
but there's so little funding and it's so low a priority, unfortunately, in the nation's scales uh, and, on the, and on the media scale. So I think that, unfortunately, um, you know, these things don't happen. When you first came to MIT in chemical engineering, you said that it was a more diverse or department than many chemi departments, and that there was even a little bit of bio. Did you come in with any kind of bio, biology training, or did you get it here? Did you ever study biology? I hadn't studied biology other than 10th grade, and I, my bachelor's thesis at uh, Cornell, I actually did something with red blood cells, but I mean, I wouldn't call that much of a training, I, you know, I just learned a little bit. Uh, so it was, it was very limited. Uh -huh. And so for your undergraduate thesis on red blood cells, why, what did, what did you do with red blood cells and why did you choose that? Well, I, I was interested in bio things even then. That was in 1970, uh, the spring of 1970. So one of the professors at Cornell, Bob Finn, uh, he was, that was his area, was blood cells and red blood cell damage. And I think I looked at factors that caused red blood cells to be damaged and maybe ways that we could protect them. So, I mean, it was kind of a, just a small bachelor's thesis, but that was the f first thing that I had done. And did you choose him because it looked like an area you were interested in, or, or you chose him for some other reason and this happened to be the thing he was working on? I chose him for two reasons. One, I liked him. I had him in a class. I, he was a nice guy, and we got along well. And two, because it was an area I was interested in. Uh-huh. And even for that thesis, did you have to start reading then about blood cells and biology and so forth and, and teaching yourself? I did. I started reading then uh, a little bit about blood cells and biology and, and teaching myself. I, I don't think I was any expert by any means, but I, right. I did start to learn a little bit. And by the end of that thesis, did you say, hmm, here's an area? I mean, you said you came into graduate work not knowing, but, right. but did it begin to be something that was forming in your mind, do you think? Not really. I mean, I, I think that I did it, and I think that was a taste of research. It uh -huh. was it was okay. It wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't that I had done anything, you know, particularly important. Uh, but I, so I, I really didn't know at that time. And your first year of graduate work, did you take a bunch of courses all over the place, or how did you structure it? Well, when you came to MIT, and when I came in 1970, there were mostly there were courses that that you're supposed to take so that you'd pass the dollar or, or not pass the doctoral qualifying exam. I mean, there were some required courses, so I took those: thermodynamics, heat and mass transfer, industrial chemistry, and there were a couple of others. I think I took catalysis, and maybe one other. And really, I. Th the, the sense that you got from your advisors and everybody else was that you should take these courses, do as well as you could, and hopefully, you know, pass the doctoral qualifying exam. And so, so that's that's what I did in my first term. And were those courses that have turned out to be really useful to you, or are they courses that would have been useful to you if you had gone into the oil industry or something? Well, it's an interesting question. I I. Um, on the one hand, I mean, it's not like I use, or at least I don't think I use those those tools today. But one of the things that I've always thought was good about chemical engineering was that it's like a really broad background, and it teaches you how to think, and and it teaches you how to think broadly, and uh, and maybe gets you into this kind of problem-solving orientation. So I guess the way I've always thought about it, correctly or incorrectly, is that learning all those things the way I did gave me a good general background, even though the specifics I, I probably uh, don't use at all. What did you do after that? How did you begin to shape your Well, program? so at the end of my, so after you pass the doctoral qualifying exam, then the next thing is you, you pick like a thesis advisor, and I looked around at what different people were doing. There weren't really that many things that were of interest to me. and. Uh, I think it came down to pick, you know, two different professors at MIT that I was talking to, and I ended up choosing one of those. I, it was Ed Merrill and Clark Colton, and I ended up, uh, uh, you know, they were both. Ed was doing things in polymers and a little bit in bio, and Clark was doing things in the bio area. I think he was the only one in the department that was, other than, like I say, Ed doing a little bit, and I ended up choosing him. And what was your thesis area? The thesis uh, that I did for my uh, PhD was called Enzymatic Regeneration of ATP, Adenosine Triphosphate. And, and the goal 
it was part of a larger project that MIT was involved in to look at enzymes for synthesizing things, and ATP was the energy source. So uh, my goal was to see if I could try to create a, a, a process that might someday be industrialized that could do that. So it sounds like by then you were beginning to think, hmm, this bio stuff is interesting. Where, did you go take any classes in it or do more reading? or The bio stuff, it, it, it appealed to me. I didn't take classes in it. I mean, they were hard to fit in my my first year, and then after that, I, um, you know, I read stuff. But I, I and I, 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 guess, I guess I went to biochemistry. I sort of audited by bio, those biochemistry 705, uh, but I didn't really take a specific course. Looking back, could you have done more of that, or it just didn't matter? I mean, because you pursued yeah. it as you needed it. I could have. Um, you know, I, I probably could have. I don't know if it would have mattered or not. You know, it's 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 a it's interesting question. I mean, I think when I end up looking at at the way my career has gone and the different things I've done, I I don't know if it would have mattered. Yeah. Um. I, yeah. It's hard to say. I've sort of ended up. I've never been a great classroom learner. I mean, even with the classes, I would end up, you know, kind of teaching myself more than. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I've I've never been great at listening to lectures. I I just. Uh, you know, daydream and things like that. So I'm not sure that classes. My mind is working. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's, you know, I mean, some people could say that my mind is working. Others could say that I have, a, you know, attention deficit disorder. <laughs> and maybe both are true. Uh, but uh, so, uh, which, which is fine. I mean, I think that it was just not my, you know, learning style. Did not having a lot of background in biology, was, was that a disadvantage or maybe even an advantage to you? Well, I think I think that cuts both ways. I mean, I think uh, when I started doing my postdoctoral work, and in particular, which was in the biological area, not having it certainly made me struggle more. But on the other hand, uh, I think I also probably did take approaches that were not bound by conventional wisdom because I didn't know right. anything. Right. Once you got your doctorate, what did you do next? So when I got my doctorate, the next big challenge for me was to figure out what I was going to do with my life. <laughs> and that was a challenge. So I, I spent a lot of time my last year of graduate school in, interviewing in jobs. And I interviewed, had a lot of interviews. I, I, uh, most of my classmates at, the t at that time, 73, 74, were going into the petrochemical industry. They had all kinds of job offers in it. And I, that's mostly what I did, too. I, I, um, I, I en ended up interviewing uh, at Exxon four different times because they had places all over the country at Shell and and um, and, and many other places and and so that's that's probably what I thought I would do because that's what most other people did but I I, I, I didn't like it that much I always think about this one interview I had at Exxon in uh, Baton Rouge Louisiana and one of the engineers there told me, you know, if I could just increase the yield of some of these petrochemicals by 0.01 percent, he said that would be great. He said that would be <laughs> worth billions. And I, I just uh, remember flying back to Boston that night thinking, I, I don't want to do that. You know, I wasn't excited by it. I didn't know exactly what I did want to do, but I could see that the conventional path of just going into industry and the petrochemical industry was something that at least wasn't that exciting to me. So then I started thinking about other things. and and. In particular, since I had done, spent so much time at the group school and developed new chemistry curricula and things like that, I was very interested as I started thinking about it more and more in um, education. And one day I saw an ad in, uh, in one of the journals for an assistant professor of chemistry, actually, at City College of New York, developing chemistry curricula. And I, I thought that was great. And so I wrote them a letter, but then they didn't respond to me. And, uh, and But I liked the idea, so I would kept looking for positions like that. And I probably found about 30 positions like that, most of them not at particularly good schools, you know. I mean, they were, uh, but they wouldn't, none of them wrote me back. You know, they just, I wasn't in this box, you know. Even though I'd gone to MIT, I wasn't in this uh, chemistry education box, so I guess people don't, don't write you back. So that, that didn't work either. So, uh, so then I, another thought I had, I was interested in, in, uh, using my education to help people. I mean, if, and, and so I started thinking about medicine. And so I wrote to a lot of hospitals and, and medical schools who, who didn't write back either. 
Another way I always tell the story, which is true, is one of the postdocs in the laboratory I was in said to me, he said, Bob, he said, there's a surgeon at uh, Children's Hospital named Judah Folkman. He said, sometimes uh, he hires unusual people. So uh, I wrote him, and he was kind enough to call me up, and I went over there, and he had uh, some projects that were just, to me, incredibly exciting. And uh, so I ended up working there. Did, did he have other chemical engineers working for him ever before, or was this a, a real um, were you very different for his lab? I was very different from his lab. I, I think he had some exposure to chemical engineers, and he was a broad thinker, but nobody in his lab uh, in 1974, I mean, was an engineer. I mean, they were all biologists or surgeons or microscopists or biochemists. I mean, there was nobody even close to an engineer. And looking back, do you think he had any kind of sense that, that an engineering set of skills would be useful for what he was trying to accomplish? I mean, it doesn't sound like he was, like he had thought, oh, I need an engineer, and he was out looking for one. Nonetheless, do you think there was some light that went on, or well, he just took to you, or? I think what he said to me was that a lot of, which is a response to something you asked earlier, is that he said a lot of people have been trying to, what he was interested in was, could you find a substance that could stop blood vessels from growing in the body? And he said a lot of people had looked at this before, you know, that had more conventional approaches like biochemists. He said they never succeeded, so he wanted to find somebody that maybe was, uh, he thought, reasonably intelligent but would take a, a fresh look at it. And the first day you showed up in the lab, where did you even know how to start or how did you go about it? It was hard. I, I would try to do reading and then I would talk to some of the people in the lab there. Then I would do more, I'd talk to him, I would do more reading, I'd get involved in some experiments. You know, I'd kind of go back and forth between talking and reading and experiments and, and, and keep going that way. Did you give yourself a time frame or did he give you a time frame? I don't think you have a specific time frame. You know, I mean, I suppose, you know, you want to try to accomplish something in a couple of years. But I don't think there was a deadline, but I, I think, um, you know, you, you, you wanted to solve the problem as soon as you could, but it was a hard problem. Did you have to invent new tools to do that at that time? I did. I had, I mean, the biggest new tool was trying to come up with these polymers that could deliver large molecules slowly over a long time and not cause damage to the body. And that was, that, that was, that would lead to another tool, which was these bioassays that, uh, one could use to study angiogenesis stimulation or angiogenesis inhibition. So those tools were critical to solving the problem. They're, they're still widely used today. Was there some point where you began to think, hmm, I'm on the right path? Yeah, well, with the polymers, I, 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 I developed these assays which uh, you could put things in these polymers, little pellets, and, and I had these gels, and the idea, there were different substances that I would put in the uh, polymer pellets, and the gels would change color if they were coming out. So I would put them on the gels every day. Most of the time, by the second day, there was nothing coming out. I mean, almost always. But, you know, I remember with one particular design, uh, they'd keep coming out day after day, even for 100 days. So as you could keep seeing them color changes, then you knew that you were on the right track. Did you put your head into his office and say, oh my goodness, this is beginning to, to work or something? Or Well, I think I would show, I'd take them and I'd show them the gels, and yeah. that was really exciting. It was great to see them change color. <laughs> I mean, in one case, the, the gel would sort of clear out and become transparent, and another case it would, you know, turn a particular color. I mean, but, you know, so sure, yeah, I would, I, I love doing that. As you worked, did you ever go back and talk to some of your former professors? Were, were they useful in consulting, or did you turn to anyone else in the field that you knew, or was this pretty much a solitary uh, project? Well, I talked to J Dr. Folkman a lot. I did talk to other people in the lab. There were surgical fellows I was working with. There was a biochemist that I was doing some work with. I don't think the chemical engineering professors, yeah, were, I, I, I didn't turn back to them, I guess, in, in this case. Um, but it was, most of what I was doing was a 
you know, was in, in such a different area, and, 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 and so few of them were, were working in that area. At, at some point, did you start thinking of going into academia? You didn't stay full-time in that lab forever. How, right. how did, uh, how long were you there, and what did you do next, and why? I was there three years. Um, you know, most of the, most of the time, of course, nobody did, in chemical engineering at least, a postdoc, which in essence was what I was doing then. Um, I, I actually probably would have been happy, at least the way I looked at it, staying there a long time. I, I really enjoyed what I was doing. But I know some of my friends kept saying, in the lab, um, David Kessler, for example, who would later become head of the FDA, he, you know, he'd say, Bob, he said, you shouldn't be a postdoc forever. He said, you should become a professor. And, and so I started applying to schools. Including MIT? Or? I did, not, not right away. I, I actually applied to a lot of schools in chemical engineering. I knew MIT wasn't hiring in chemical engineering. At that time, they weren't hiring anybody inside uh, that had graduated from the department. Uh, th th they did that for a number of years. But I applied to a lot of other schools in chemical engineering, and they didn't want to hire me. So uh, one day, I guess, uh, I mean, they, they, they were intrigued. They offered me job interviews, and I, 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 but I think when I went to those schools, they, um, you know, they were saying, well, the kinds of ideas that I was talking about, like angiogenesis and right. drug delivery, and I had some ideas on enzymes. I mean, they said, well, these aren't chemical engineering. You know, they, they, they don't see that as chemical engineering. Um, it's interesting to see how chemical engineering is today on the other hand, but, uh, that, you know, I mean, it's interesting because what I was doing ended up becoming chemical engineering in the future, but, uh, but it wasn't chemical engineering at that time as, as they saw it. So at any rate, I didn't get any of those positions. Dr. Folkman then later talked to Nevin Scrimshaw, who was head of the Nutrition and Food Science Department at MIT, and uh, because Dr. Folkman talked very positively about me, I guess ne Nevin Scrimshaw offered me a position in, in what was then the Nutrition and Food Science Department. So course I did, 20? What, course 20, yeah, and so I, I came here. In that department, not in Chem E. That's right. I came here in 1977 as a visiting assistant professor. I still actually maintained uh, the lab at Children's Hospital, uh, but I, I came as a visiting assistant professor in 1977, as a regular assistant professor in 1978 in, in, uh, in nutrition and food science, and later on that would become the Department of Applied Biological Sciences. And how, how well did that work? I mean, did, did, how was the fit once you got here in, in that capacity? Well, early, I mean, it was, there were, there were positives and negatives. I, I, I guess I felt from the standpoint of the students, it was very positive. I mean, the students were, I think, very excited about what I was doing. I had a lot of students who wanted to work in the lab. Mostly grad students you're talking? Yes, graduate students and also undergraduate students. Uh, and I got some postdocs too, so in that sense, the fit was good. But the faculty in those days, I didn't, the Nutrition and Food Science Department when I came to it sort of had five distinct areas. And what I was doing really didn't fit in any of them. So I think that they weren't real, so I think it's fair to say they weren't real positive about me. I recall there was a time a couple years, years after I started where several of the senior professors told me that I had no future in the department and that I probably should leave. And your reaction was, or how did you? I was, I was, <laughs> well, my you first couple of years, I should add to, to that, it wasn't only that they told me to leave. I wasn't like I was doing that well on grants either. I had my first nine grants turned down. I also had, uh, um, you know, a lot of people feeling that the science, you know, uh, since what I was proposing and what we were doing sort of went against a lot of the conventional wisdom. I had a lot of people, I think, who were skeptical of the science that I was doing at the time. I mean, not necessarily at MIT, but right. outside MIT. So my, my first few years from the standpoint of my future uh, probably weren't that good in that sense. So, I mean, that's probably putting it mildly. Could you have fit in some hospital somewhere? And did you ever think of whether you should go get a medical degree or, or go work in a hospital research setting? I thought about it, but I also felt that, at least from what I could see, that the people who were driving things in, in medicine 
you know, we're medical doctors. And, and I think that, I don't want to say that I'd necessarily be a second-class citizen, but I, I think that, that I could see some value in having the background that I had and, um, you know, and, 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 and being in a, a, a more scientifically or engineering-based department. I also, I suppose, to a certain extent, was doing that. In other words, I still, for many years, and I mean, I still have it today. I had an appointment at Boston Children's Hospital. I had a, I, I had a lab there, too. So, uh, so in a way, I, I really was having both. I, I did have a medical appointment, I mean, in terms of doing research, right. and I had, you know, this more academic appointment at MIT. So in a way, I was, I, I was still doing both, because I had, and I would actually drive back and forth quite a bit. How'd you get out of this crunch? <laughs> what, what finally made it to begin to fall into place? I think what happens is after a period of time, and certainly this happened for me, people on the outside, you know, uh, were positive about, you know, they felt I was doing important things. So, uh, you know, the NIH decided that the grants were important and they got really good reviews. People in industry, like I think somebody, you know, they write letters to people and I think they wrote to Roy Vagelos, who was president of Merck at the time, and he said I was doing really good things. So a lot of people on the outside started to say, and they, that, that the, this work was really important, that they'd like to have me work for Merck or work for, you know, them. Um, and, and so I think that people wrote very strong letters or they gave very good feedback. Again, I was not directly involved in this, but this is kind of what I heard. And that, and so people felt that the things that I was proposing and doing, they were, they were important and they, they might change the way pharmaceutical science was done. So you were still in nutrition and food science at that point. Yes. Headed for maybe not getting tenure or, or they headed, did headed, give you tenure after all, or, well, uh, or you I, moved? No, I was headed. For, I was headed for, according to some of them, not even getting reappointed. Um, but I did get reappointed. I did get promoted. I actually got tenure even early. But <laughs> you know, but but it, but the first couple of years, you know, were were, were, were tough. Huh. And then and then it just totally turned around <clears throat> because I think you really the the the, the message from the outside world in in many ways grant support you know on peer reviewed grants papers and you know and i i would publish and this was very unusual for an engineer in journals like science and nature and you know and they you know very very high impact journals and uh and students you know really liked what i was doing so i think in the end all those things you know turned it around and so Every, everything changed. And so suddenly the department, instead of having five traditional uh, pathways, had a sixth one, yours, or? Well, I don't know if they looked at, clear? I don't know if they looked at it quite that way. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that they looked at it quite that way, but they, you know, and I think the department, you know, kept changing in, 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 in different ways. But, um, but they they just had me in addition, and later on they'd have uh, Alex Klebanoff who was doing some uh, different things, and so I think the department you know had had some new leadership and uh, by Jerry Wogan at that time, and it and it just uh, it it, it kind of took a different attitude. They're getting more interested in I guess what I'd call biotechnology, and I think in a broad sense what I was doing and later what Alex was doing would, would, would fit into biotechnology. At some point, though, you moved into course 10, the chemical engineering. When did that happen and how? That happened in 1988. And what happened in 1988 was that MIT, all of a sudden, so the Nutrition and Food Science Department in 1985 changed its name to the Department of Applied Biological Sciences. And in 1988, MIT decided that they uh, didn't want that department anymore. So. Uh, they sort of reorganized everything, and different people in that department went to other departments, and I went into chemical engineering. Was it an issue? So that would have been in the School of Science as opposed to the School of Engineering? That's correct. And you really had an engineering background and an engineering approach to work, even though you were working on scientific problems, I guess. What, what was that like? Did it matter? I think, I think it was may be complex in some ways for people in the School of Science to judge an engineer. But on the other hand, 
you know, what they would do is, you know, they would write letters to people, and, and I think my papers were in journals that, even if I was an engineer, like I said, I did have papers in science and nature mm -hmm. that, you know, that they could judge were, were high-impact papers. I had, you know, quite a bit of peer-reviewed NIH grant support by that time and NSF grant support. So I think, you know, there's certain kinds of criteria that, that, that people could use, and I think probably did use in, in my case. And then you moved into the engineering school because the, the, your department folded and it seemed like the best fit? Or? That's right. I mean, I was a chemical engineer, and, and uh, they came over and talked to me in chemical engineering and, and asked if I would join that department. I'm Probably there were other places I could have gone. But, um, but yeah, it's, I think what you said is right. It's probably right. the best fit. And in terms of your lab work, were you doing it on campus at that point, or still doing it over at the hospital, or? Most of it was on campus at that point. I probably did a little bit at the hospital. I, I did do some of the hospital even by 1988, but I did most of it here at MIT. And students were beginning to be very interested in these areas, and, and you were one of the few people on campus doing work in this field? That's right. Even, I mean, certainly, even in 1988, there weren't a lot of people doing work in this area, very, very few. And, and I had an enormous number of students uh, interested. In fact, I think when I started doing this, in when I first joined the Chemie department in 1988, I think something like 13 or 14 people out of, I don't know, 25 put my lab down as their first choice for a doctoral thesis. <laughs> and that, that, of course, I, I, they ended up having to change <laughs> some rules after that. I didn't take all those people, but, but it was, uh, you know, but, but it was very popular. And it, did, did that fuel any kind of recognition in the department or the school or the university that, that maybe they needed to do more of this or, or that uh, it was a hot area or a growing area of interest? Yeah, well, certainly over time it would. I don't know if it was because of that or because of me or, or, or what I did was just uh -huh. a part of it. But I think over time, a whole range of things, you know, student interest, you know, impact, NIH funding, um, you know, probably did allow MIT to see, you know, that these things were potentially important. Did any other universities have more of a biotechnology um, approach or, or um, centers of activity by this time? We were talking about, I guess, the late 80s. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say no. There were some departments of biomedical engineering, certainly, and MIT did not have one. So there were a few departments of biomedical engineering. Chemical engineering, um, I would say probably not. You know, I think that usually they had like one, every every school sort of had their one professor, or maybe two, but <laughs> would, usually one. Doing. Would it have been helpful to you had there been a larger critical mass of these people in a bioengineering uh, department at that time, or did do you think it didn't really matter? It might have been a little helpful just to have had mentors and stuff like that. But, you know, in the end, I gained from collaborating with people who are very different from me, and um, <clears throat> so I, you know, I don't know. It's always always hard to know. You know, we, I didn't have those controls, so I don't know. When MIT approved the new degree in biological engineering, it was the first new course of study I think that they had approved in something like 39 years. How much difference has has that made? Has it made any difference to you? And and what about students? I don't know if it's made that much difference to me because I pull in people from probably about 10 different disciplines, uh, both at the graduate level and uh, postdoctoral level and undergraduate level. I think from a student standpoint, it makes a difference. Uh, I may not be the best person to judge that, but I think it makes a difference. I think, you know, a number of students take that option and I think are excited by it. You mentioned that you were beginning to get some outside recognition earlier on at places like uh, Merck and other pharmaceutical companies. Did you ever consider going to work for a company like that, for Merck or, or another company in that business? I did. Well, I mean, I did a little bit. I mean, they, they offered me positions and they offered me, you know, good positions. So did some other universities. And so I thought about it from time to time. I mean, you know, the, the, the offers continue to this day, both at companies and other universities. But I, and I, and I, and I have to say, I've thought about it. Uh, a little bit from time to time, but I've never left. What holds you here? Well, I, I mean, I still think 
a MIT is the best place, and and uh, and I think that what does that mean? It means I, I've been able to just have exceptional students and exceptional colleagues. And there was a time when I would get incredibly good offers from other universities, and I was like not a full professor here, and they would offer me sometimes much higher salaries and much greater packages and stuff like that. And there were some pretty good universities. But I guess I felt that would come in time here, too. And, uh, you know, it has. Uh, well, maybe not all the things they would have offered, but, but a lot of things that, you know, a lot of things have. <clears throat> I think also, um, I, it goes back to me, it goes back to the point that you asked me earlier about how I pick ideas. How can I have the greatest impact? And, and I really feel I can probably have the greatest impact here. You know, some of the positions at other schools or leadership positions, you know, being head of institutes or deans or, you know, whatever. I mean, and I just, uh, you know, I think that, I mean, I probably could do them. And I, I, I've had people offer me things like that here, too. But I, I, I think doing what I do, I probably have the greatest impact. There are some people who delight in starting new things, but take less satisfaction in, in running them on a day-to-day -day basis. You, you seem to have done both. Do you, do you get equal satisfaction from both? Well, I get a lot of satisfaction from both. I probably like starting things more in a way, but I also realize that if I'm going to make an impact, I have to finish them, you know, or at least I have to follow them through to the point where they'll be um, they'll be strong enough to succeed, you know, on their own. What was involved in setting up your own lab here? When, when did you actually do that and how did it develop? Well, it really would evolve over time. I mean, I, I guess, you know, when I first started, I didn't have very much lab space at all. I was doing things at Children's Hospital, and I, but I was running the teaching lab, so I could, so the nine months a year that I was using the teaching lab, I'd have more lab space here, <laughs> and, and I'd use it. Then um, I was actually the first uh, occupant of the Whitaker Health Sciences Building in 1982, and that was my first, you know, real lab space. Uh, and I didn't have very much, but we kept on getting a little bit more, a little bit more, and, you know, that's still where we are today, though we'll be moving to the Koch Institute building and, in, uh, you know, as soon as that opens. But, you know, basically the things that it involved were, you know, equipping it and then equipping it more. But mostly it's all about people. And I, you know, so I, I had great students and, you know, at different levels and, and really good postdocs. And, and so that's how I would do it. How many applicants do you get to, to work in your lab? There must be. N now? Yeah. Thousands every year. I mean, we get, uh, but some of that has to do with the publicity we've gotten in different journals like Science, both Science, you know, I, I, I forget what the number was exactly, and then Science in 1999 had a cover story about what it was like to be a postdoc, and they highlighted our lab in particular. In fact, our, I think they had nine of our postdocs on the cover, and, you know, had really a very positive article. Uh, you know, about what it was like to be a postdoc in our lab, and then the number increased uh, quite a bit. And then I think this year, uh, and as you mentioned, Nature uh, wrote an article about what it was like to... To be Bob Lang. To be Bob Lang, <laughs> but to be in our lab, too, and, and the like, number increased again. So like we, being John Malkovich? <laughs> yeah, right, right. So, but it was... Uh, but So we, we get an awful lot of people, I mean, thousands. How do you sort through them, and what do you look for? Well, I... I, I guess there's a lot, a lot of things. I, I, um, I look, sometimes it happens that particular people I know, the professors I, I might know might write me or call me or, or the student works for them, and, and, and that's one thing. Then I have a real uh, easy path to find out how good they are. I also look at the quality of schools, the quality of the publications. Um, if somebody sends a letter, I, I'm you know, saying this is by far the best person they've ever had, I, I look at that. I also have some people in my group help me. I mean, so I do all those things. But is there something about trying to judge the, the quality of their creativity or the quality of that plus their stubbornness? In other words, do you, do you sort of look for yourself in these people? And, and do your pipeline professors, um, your network, understand that? Or are they good at judging those things, too? Nobody's perfect at judging those things, including me. Uh, but I think you can get 
you could get some sense from what their, you know, what their advisors say, you know, and what the people who've known them say. Yeah. And I think that that's, for, that that's very helpful. Does your having struggled a little in, in sort of finding the right path affect how you choose people or, or what you look for? Or, or was the initial problem maybe just that the path you wanted didn't exist yet and that was why you were having trouble getting onto it? I think some of both. I think the fact that the path that I wanted didn't exist uh, was important. And I do, if somebody has a really outstanding background, well, I'll, I'll just make this up, but I mean, let's say somebody came to us with a physics or electrical engineering background and they were just a superstar, mm -hmm. you know, I would be interested in that person, mm -hmm. you know, even if they didn't have exactly the right background for, for the lab. But generally, people will apply to the lab who have backgrounds that you know, sort of seem to fit with the things that we've, we've published on. And what are the constraints? I mean, you have about 100 people in your lab, I think. I mean, could you have 150 tomorrow if you wanted? Or is it a question of how much, you've, how much grant money you've got at the time or what projects they could? In other words, what, what determines how fast you grow and where you put people and so forth? Well, one of the th there's two things probably, three things, space, money, and time. Um, I'd say space is probably the single biggest limitation at this minute. I mean, that may change, but space is probably the biggest limitation. Um, I think you also don't grow really fast. In other words, our lab is very, very large, but it didn't grow like in an instant. It, it uh, you know, and, and, and so, uh, you know, when you have a number of people, they can help other people, and so I wouldn't want to grow from 100 and 250 in an instant. Uh, I, 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 I'm pretty happy with where we are right now, but a lot of it depends on the problems you're trying to solve, the grants you get, um, you know, and then we've sort of done a slow growth, but we've done it over over many years. Are there disadvantages to being so large, or, or are you not at that point yet? Well, I think there are pluses and minuses. I, I personally believe the pluses outweigh the minuses, particularly for the problems we're trying to do, which are very interdisciplinary and sometimes take the ideas all the way from an idea mm -hmm. to the point where it'll be in the clinic or close to it. And so, um, but sure, I mean, if there's a lot of people, I probably can't spend as much time with any one individual now as I did, say, 25, 30 years ago. What makes a successful lab? I think the people feeling happy, I think a variety of things. I think the people feeling happy, feeling fulfilled, you know, making an impact. Um, I think those kinds of things. Do you have many undergraduates there? We do. I, my understanding from the Europe office is we have the largest uh, Europe, uh, number of Europe's in MIT. So yeah, I, I'd say we probably do. That's the Undergraduate Research Opportunities Program. Right, when they had their 40th anniversary, they wanted me to speak, and that was one of the comments they made. They said, I have to, since we have the big, we've had more Europe's than anybody else, I guess, in the history of MIT. Uh-huh. Any, I mean, is this like a handful each semester, or? or oh, we probably have, have 30 does, or 40, we have probably 30 really? or 40 Europe's, maybe 30 to 50, I'd have to. And do some of them then come back semester after semester? They're Most of them do, yeah. They've, they've, they've really enjoyed it, and so we have, we have a lot of return people. I've had people start as a freshman and go all the way through senior year. Have you seen much change in students at MIT since you started teaching and running a lab, or, or not? There's some change, but I don't think in a, fun, I think in a fundamental way, not, not really. I mean, I think well, I, I shouldn't say that. I mean, I think there are certainly many more women now than there were when I started. Um, I think there's, I was going to say, I think there's more of a social conscience, but I'm not sure. That I, I'd have to think about that more. Uh, but there are some changes. And there's been so much attention in recent years, particularly after Larry Summers made his comments about women and science. Do you see different styles uh, among the women and the men overall, or, or not really? Well, I mean, all people are different. I mean, women and men, but, you know, men and men are different, women and women are different. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think whether I'd say I see different styles. I, I guess I feel it's almost too much of a generalization, but I do think that young women 
you know, it's, it's, it's really good and nice that there are women professors because I think it's nice, as we talked about before, to have good role models. And I think that that's a very helpful thing for young women to say. Do you have any advice for students or for researchers um, about how to make a student's experience in the labs um, successful, useful, interesting? Well, I think you want to pick really important projects. I think, you know, I, I, I personally, and, and, and to amplify that a little bit, I think it's good, I think it's okay to take risks. I think that that's, you know, it's good to try to shoot for high impact projects. And, and so I, th I think that's really, really important. Sometimes people don't, you know, because they're afraid about tenure or grants, you know, they, 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 they won't necessarily do that. So I think that that's one thing that I do think is, is worthwhile doing. I think that being said, you also want to think what will make good projects for students. And so there ought to be, even if it's high risk, stopping off points so that they'll get some papers and they'll be able to accomplish some things. Were you a risk taker as a, a child? <laughs> You know, I don't know if I was, you know, I mean, but again, when I was a child, I was probably doing more physical things, you know, sports and stuff like that. Um, you know, I don't know that I would like jump off anything or things like that. But I, I you know, intellectual things, I suppose, are different. Do you usually give them students, be they undergraduates or graduates or even postdocs, specific questions that will be theirs to try to answer when they come in, say the way Judah Folkman seems to have done with you? Absolutely, or? yeah. I mean, that's what I do. And I mean, I, I encourage them to come up with other things too, but I, I absolutely give them specific things to work on. And how do you find a fit, or, or do you not just worry so much about that? You, you say, here, here's something, or here are three or four things any of them appeal to you? or? Well, I think students often come with a, some idea of a general area they might want to work in, like nanotechnology or mm -hmm. regenerative medicine. You know, so I, I might pick something in an area like that. Do you take in any high school students? We have, yes. These are people generally who are aiming for Intel projects or Westinghouse? or No, not really. I mean, a lot of times it's people who have projects, you know, uh, that that they might want to do, you know, we we've done a couple of we've had, we've had a number of high school, you know, it's just like sometimes it's summer jobs and things like that. Sometimes it's a it's a spring project. It's not something we do that often, but we mm -hmm. we you know if they're high school students and in particular if they're eighteen, you know, there might, there's certain liability issues. That, you know, we 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 we've done it. Does there have to be some threshold that they need to be at in terms of knowledge or skills before they can really be participants? And do you have a clear sense of what that is? I think it helps to have uh, that, but I don't feel that that's absolutely critical. I mean, it depends on the situation. How would you describe your role at the lab today? Um, how much time do you spend as a manager versus as a researcher? Or do you do hands-on research at this point? I don't really do hands-on research myself, but I mean, I mostly, you know, but I spend a lot of time brainstorming with the students and postdocs. I mean, that's probably one of the things that I, yeah, and then I, I guess I spend a lot of time giving advice. I mean, that's what my wife says. That, <laughs> and I suppose when you look at the Nature article, that's, that's probably true. I spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, so the, 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 those are the things that I probably spend the most time doing, you know, thinking, brainstorming, and, and, and giving advice. Do you miss the hands-on part, or are you happy enough to do more of the thinking and let yeah. someone else do the... I don't miss the hands-on part. I'm not sure that that was ever my real strength either. You know, I, I think I'm more of an ideas person than I am, uh, you know, I don't think I've ever been exceptionally good at using a pipette or things like that. I think other people can, uh, can do hands-on stuff as well, if not better than I can. At some point, you were talking about your, your work having become not just respectable, actually, but, but highly respected. Um, You've won nearly 200 awards, maybe more than 200 by now, um, including Charles Stark Draper, which is sometimes described as the Nobel Prize for Engineering. Um, last year, you won the Millennium Prize, which is described as the, the world's largest tech, technology prize. Um, was there some turning point? Do you recall sort of what you went, you know, suddenly? People were scornful or, or dubious, I guess, yeah. maybe, and then all of a sudden, uh, was it one or two papers being published? Or 
Well, the papers have been published. I think that, uh, but I don't. Th I think you're right. People were scornful of of the of the work early on. I think time takes care of that, you know, and yeah. the impact that those papers would make. And that and, uh, but I don't know that there was a particular point in time. We talked a little bit earlier about, you know, getting tenure, and I think there was certainly you'd start to see a change in in, 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 yeah. in, in people's attitudes even even then. But I think over time, what's happened is the impact of those papers and of our discoveries and inventions, I think, increased. And, you know, you never know what's going to happen. I mean, but I think the very fact that they would keep increasing over time, you know, probably affects that recognition. Has winning all of the awards made any difference in either your research or your life? Well, in my research, I don't think so, other than that probably it even enhances further the number of people who apply to your lab. And I think it, it also, I think, gives the areas that we work in, like bioengineering and biomedical engineering, maybe more respectability in, 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 in the world. I think the Draper Prize, I think, as I recall, the Draper Prize, mine is the only time it's ever been given in, in bioengineering. I mean, usually it's in some type of computer or internet thing. Uh, so I think it, it helps in that. In terms of my life, I mean, you know, you get a certain amount of money for these awards, and I mean, that's, that's I think, a nice thing, and it makes you feel better, and even my mom feel better. <laughs> You'll be able to afford college for your children? Yes, yes, we can do that, though MIT helps you on that. <laughs> um, you also pop up regularly on lists of extraordinary people. Um, Again, to, to list a bit, Forbes said you were one of 15 innovators who will reinvent our future. Um, Parade Magazine called you one of six heroes whose research may save your life. Time Magazine called you one of the 100 most important peoples in, people in America. When you were, were you surprised when you started being recognized in this way? And do these lists affect your life, and, and have you found any way to use it as, as a bully pulpit? You talked about the role of the media in terms of interesting, trying to bring um, young children into science. To, are any of these useful in that respect, do you think? Well, maybe to go backwards, I think that, that I, whether they want to publicize me or other people that use science to help people uh, to me is good. I mean, I, you know, and so, I, and actually, I'm, I always, when I get calls from the media, I'm, I try to be really responsive. I mean, uh, you know, and, 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 and I, I, I just think that's really important. So I, so, because I think any, and I also always like it to be accurate, too. So I, I um, so to me, it's not like I could use it as a bully pulpit. I, I don't, but I, I, I don't even know how I'd do it. But I, but I think the very fact that they would devote issues or covers of parade to people doing medical things that are helping people, I think, is good. And uh, um, whether it's me or anybody, and the same thing for all the other uh, things like Time and and um, Forbes. Um, I don't think it changes your, your, your life in a, in a fundamental way, uh, but I think it's nice. I mean, it makes you feel good and it makes your family feel good. <laughs> um, let's turn to the economic side of, and, and business side of what you're doing. Um, we talked about how many patents you have um, already or in process, and a lot of them have been licensed or sub-licensed. Um, I think to more than 200 companies at this point. What is that involved, and, and how ac involved are you with the licenses, licensing process and the licensees once they get them? Yeah, well, basically, so we in our lab has a lot of patents. Uh, you know, it's the students, the postdocs, myself, and you know, so we file the patents. MIT has a terrific technology licensing office. I mean, probably as good as any in the country. And uh, so they they do it. I, I actually, sometimes somebody comes to me and I would make that introduction uh, and have them talk to the people in the licensing office. But sometimes what's happened is it's just the license and then we might get a grant from the company and that's great. Sometimes company might start 
based on one of these technologies, and I'm often involved in helping that happen too, you know, maybe as a founder of a company or a member of the board of directors or a member of the scientific advisory board. And, and so, you know, it really depends on the situation. But to me, those are all also really good things because if companies pick up what we do, the chances of them making an impact are, are that much greater. So I, I guess I want to do whatever I can to help. Some universities have earned really significant revenues from um, patents and royalties from discoveries by their professors. Um, in some cases, NYU right now and, and Columbia had a long-running uh, profitable patent, um, hundreds of millions of dollars. Do you think any of yours have that kind of financial potential? Well, I don't know if any I mean, I hope so, uh, but uh, I think that, um, and some of them already have, I think, brought in some substantial amounts of money, not necessarily through the sales, but also I think MIT's taken equity in some of the companies, and I think that, uh, it's not, while it's not hundreds of millions of dollars, I think, uh, you know, I think in some cases, I think it's led to, you know, a number, many millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what your first patent was? I think the well, the first one we filed was actually on what we talked about before: controlled release of large molecules from the Judah Folkman lab. Yeah. Yes. So that one's expired by now, right? Yes. They have yes. what seventeen-year lives. I think? That's they. They did now. They they now they'd be twenty from the date of issue, from the date of filing. But then it was seventeen from the date of issue. You're correct. You, you mentioned that you're engaged uh, in, in a variety of startup companies. Um, what's that like? Uh, do you remember the first one? Can you walk us through a recent one? Or? Sure. Well, I'll give a general idea and then I can give you a specific, I can go through the first one. Um, but it, I mean, it's fun, it's exciting, and it's important. And, and almost always I've been able to do it with my students and postdocs and, 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 and work with them and, and my friends and colleagues. Uh, Basically, you know, what I do is, I mean, today is like if we had an idea and one of the students or postdocs wanted to start a company, I might, and, and I thought it made sense, you know, that it was far enough along, you know, I might talk to some venture capitalists and some of my students now are venture capitalists too, which are, are former students are venture capitalists. So, you know, and, I, and, and I'd make that introduction to venture people might talk to MIT, you know, we try to put something together and, uh, you know, rent some space and try to create that technology. Um, so uh, just to, as an example, um, let's see, uh, uh, the earliest one was uh, Alex Klebanoff and I uh, had this idea about using microspheres in different areas and we formed a little company called Enzatech and the idea would be to use microspheres in the, for drug delivery and also in the food area. and. Uh, so four of my students began to work there. We got uh, venture capital and we got a CEO. We rented some space. Over time, what would happen is uh, the, um, well, the drug delivery company merged with another company uh, and, and they uh, now make these microspheres. Some of them have been now used in treating different diseases like schizophrenia, alcoholism, cancer, things like that. So they, they've, they've done quite well. The, the one that was doing the food work actually went public, uh, made things that were like microspheres for fat substitutes and things like that. Eventually, they got bought by a, a, a very large food company. Uh, and uh, so, but they're both still around doing well. How did you learn about the business side of all this? I mean, did you have to go read some books on finance or did you have a friend who sort of guided you through all this? Or? I think uh, I, uh, neither, uh, you know, it's really trial by fire, learning by doing. I did learn something by being an advisor or consultant to companies, but really I, I had no idea. I mean, I would just do it and probably make my share of mistakes and, and uh, you know, learn from doing that. Are there any mistakes that, that you've talked about? I mean, big mistakes that you say, oh my goodness, in hindsight, how could I have done that? Or, gee, I wish I had known? Or well, all kinds of things. I mean, I'm not even sure where to start. But I mean, <laughs> you know, let me just start with licenses rather than uh, companies. You know, when we first 
to have that patent for controlled release of, of large molecules. I remember we licensed it to an animal health company, a multi-billion dollar company, and they gave me a $200,000 a year grant. This was early 80s, and I was wonderful, you know, and they gave me a consulting fee. I thought, this is great. But then they, they weren't, they didn't do a very good job of developing it. And then, the, then a year later, the same, uh, another company, one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, licensed the technology now for human health. And I remember they did a couple of experiments and they didn't work and they kind of just gave up. And, but again, I got a big grant and I got the consulting thing, so I was excited about that, but I was frustrated by the fact that it didn't work. Uh, I'm sorry, that they didn't, the company didn't push it. Yeah. And that, that coupled with some other experiences being involved in small companies made me realize that these small companies just have the passion and you know sort of this live or die attitude on these technologies. And so, so one of the lessons I learned was that small companies, at least in the United States, could could really develop these technologies, which are still pretty early. You know, in many cases, much larger than much better than large companies, even though the large companies had the resources. Um, be lots of other lessons you'd learn too. I mean. Um, you know, some, uh, you know, just having to look at how do you make sure that the companies keep developing these technologies, whether they are large or small. Uh, others are, you know, more intangible. How do you find really good business people to work with? That's, that's extremely hard, but critical. I mean, having the right business partners is one of the most, probably the most important thing when I, I think about these companies. So there's just lots and lots of lessons. And how do you find the right business partners? You, you've tended to work with some of the same ones over and over again, and, and maybe they're responsible then for yeah. filling out the blanks? Yeah. Well, I work with some of the same venture capitalists over and over again, and, and that took some time, too, to realize the venture capitalists I'd like to work with most. And, and uh, you know, I do a lot with Polaris Ventures, and a lot of that has to do with really the way they've treated me and treated other people. <clears throat> and what you said is correct. I mean, I, I help on finding the CEOs. CEOs is part of what I mean. But I think that a lot of times they're better at it than I am. And so you kind of all work at it together to try to figure out who is really the right, you know, people who are going to lead the particular company. And these tend to be people with background in science or background in business or both? Or is there any uh, formula? I don't think there is a formula. You know, and when I look at great CEOs, I don't know that, that there has been a formula other than that they've had a been passionate, they've been very smart, they work incredibly hard, they may dream, you know, but there's no formula in terms of their exact mm. discipline. Have you ended up doing anything with the Sloan School of Business at MIT in terms of uh, helping to educate some of the people who come through about what it takes to do things like this and how important it is in a way if it's going to get out to people? So, the, so there's a Sloan Fellows program, and I think I give a lecture to them every year, and I give examples of companies, and then, so I think that that's, they keep wanting me to do it, so I guess they must think the lecture's okay. And then a number of the Sloan <laughs> Fellows have, actually I've been involved in, start, in helping a couple of them start companies, and um, you know, by introducing them to people in our lab and maybe helping them get started. It, it seems like, as the number of these um, business ventures grow, as, as your number of patents grows and you look for ways to bring them to, to the real world, I guess, um, they have the potential for eating up all your time. How do you juggle it all? I mean, you're on their advisory boards and their yeah. boards of directors and you're running this bigger lab and you're yeah. teaching. And yeah, it hasn't gotten to that point yet, but um, I, think, I think what happens is that I... I kind of view these companies as almost like children growing up. And when you start them, they need a lot of nurturing. As they get a little bit older, they need a lot less. And as they get a lot older, they may not want any at all, or they may want a little bit. And I'm happy to do whatever works for them. But I found that as they've grown bigger and stronger, my time commitment is much less. And uh, so really the time that it takes is is mostly in the earliest stages and you know and so you just don't do 10 at once I mean you you know you do so so I, so I've been involved in many but it's been over a fairly long time do you run any kind of seminar at the lab for sort of how to get started on the business side you have so many people including so many young people is there a training function there 
There isn't exactly, but what, uh, one of the things that the postdocs have had me do, uh, and sometimes the graduate students, which I enjoy doing, is we have different topics. You know, one could be how to find an industrial job or how to, you know, uh, get a write grants or how to get a position or could be how, with the company things and you know so I talk a little bit and then they ask lots of questions and and you know you know usually over pizza for a couple hours and uh, and so I think those kinds of things so it's not like a formal seminar uh -huh. but uh, but uh, but there's a lot of interaction and it's the final line of advice but worry about the science and engineering first the rest will come later it really isn't. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it, there's no, I don't think there's a single piece of advice. I think that, I mean, there's many. And, and I also think that um, the science and engineering are important, but it really isn't the only important thing. I mean, I really think understanding, you know, having the right business partners, having thought, it's, it's very different. I think the companies are very different, especially in the medical area, than the things that we do in the lab, um, and, 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 and even though this is a little bit off topic in terms of what you're asking, I mean, what I would say when I look at successful companies, probably the, some of the companies that I can think of that have been incredibly successful, they don't even end up doing close to what they did, what they proposed to do originally. I mean, but because their That's business people are so good, they've been able to raise a lot of money for their initial idea. and then they were able to acquire other things. So, I mean, just to give an example, like you could take the genomics area, and I'll just pick Millennium as an example. I was one of, an advisor to them, and, and, you know, so Mark Levin, who is actually an engineer, he's from WashU, he, he was the CEO of that, and he's just, just an outstanding guy, and he raised tons of money. I think today the genomics stuff that they acquired, I mean, that didn't lead to nearly, you know, what I think they hoped that was based on what they hoped it to achieve. Uh, on the other hand, they acquired some companies that were struggling, and that that they, some of those companies had some very good drugs like Velcade, and you know, and ended up becoming an incredibly successful company. And so I think that it's a combination of good business and good science. Has the downturn in the economy and the financial markets affected the? Um pace of, of the commercialization of, of uh, some of your work? I don't think it's affected it too much. I think it, you do struggle a little harder to raise uh, a lot of money, but I think it, it, it still seems to be happening uh, at a pretty good pace. You talked about the various um, relationships with some of the um, companies that were trying to commercialize your work. I think there's been growing recognition of the importance of bringing um, scientific findings, particularly from universities, to to the marketplace. And there was the Bayh-Dole Act back in the early mm -hmm. 80s. But at the same time, there seem to be growing concerns about whether there are potentials for conflict and whether some universities have occasionally overstepped lines that uh, critics were unhappy with. How much does this concern you, and what do you do about it? How do you think about it? Well, I think it's a concern. I think MIT is in a somewhat different place. I mean, I think the biggest time conflict of interest occurs are for clinical people, where they may be doing clinical trials and hold equity in some company. I think MIT has pretty clear rules uh, on what to do, and, and, and I think those rules are, by and large, fine. In fact, I think even conservative. But um, my feeling is whatever the rules are is what we'll do, you know, and I think the rules are total disclosure to MIT and, 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 and if there's, a, yeah, and you don't get grants from companies you hold equity in. I mean, th those are, I mean, again, at a pretty high level, the, the, some of the key things. And so I think that's fine. I think, I think, though, to come back to what one of the things that you and I talked about earlier, it's disappointing to me that the newspapers and media give so much attention to conflict of interest when I would rather see them give attention to how science can really help people. But, you know, they seem to, you know, and the same thing with senators. I, I, I guess I wish rather than them paying, so, so I, I, I'm not trying to say it's unimportant. I think it is important. Mm -hmm. But I think on the scale of things, it's not nearly as important as 
making young people think that science is something that's and engineering are things that can be wonderful and change the world. So I think the amount of attention that it's given, both by the Congress and by the media, is disproportionate to its importance. Usually it's a very, very tiny percentage of people that engage in things that you know might cause problems. Whereas if you had a lot of great scientists and engineers, they'd be doing all kinds of great things for this country and the world. Do you run into companies that, that want sole control over a set of ideas or, or the uh, research they're financing, and, and how do you handle that? Uh, the answer is yes, but MIT is usually pretty good in terms of the technology licensing office of saying, well, you know, you have to spend a certain amount of money per year to develop it. And if you and 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 so they and they craft the licenses, I think, in ways that uh, really cause the companies to not be able to do what you said unless they'd spent an enormous amount of money. And if they did, mm -hmm. then maybe that's okay. But but in other words, I think MIT, TLO, they they tie these things to to uh, you know really making sure the companies develop it in the strong in the best possible way. How do you know when something is ready or, or has good potential? Or, or, and do you go knocking on doors, or do they come to you? Does it depend on uh, publications? Or the, the rules that I've used, um, I think Harvard Business School even did a, did, they did do a case study on it. I I've basically picked the following rules, which may not always be right. But I've said, like, what we want is uh, what I'll call a, a platform technology, meaning you have a technology that can be used over and over again, but just change the drug substance, for example. The second thing is that it lead to products, say more than information. The third, that it be published in a very high profile journal like Science or Nature. And I, I don't mean it to be just like to have that kind of snob appeal, but I mean that it really be some kind of breakthrough. Um, you know, and, and, and fourth, that we have patents that flow out of those uh, publications that are really broad blocking patents. And fifth, that we have, you know, really convincing proof in animals, you know, not just like test tubes or something like that. And I think if we have all those things and then some of the students or postdocs in the lab really want to do it, you know, then I generally feel it makes sense. And there are a lot of venture capitalists that do come to ask us what we're doing. In fact, a lot of them know anyhow because they worked in our labs and, you know, now are real life full-time venture capitalists, and they're still very much in touch with me and other people in the lab. How many commercial ventures are, are coming out of the lab? Um, is, it possible, is there an average or, or something typical per year? Or? Well, I, I would imagine maybe it's one at most two per year, but, you know, then there are also licenses as well, and that, that might be more. Uh -huh. Has the Internet made much difference in terms of the sharing of information or... or publication, I mean, you just mentioned that putting something in a high-profile journal um, is important, but I wondered, given the turmoil in, in the whole area of media, whether that's changing. Well, I still think that, so, so to me, making sure that scientists think it's, it's really great, you know, and really a breakthrough, I, I, I don't, I still think today being in a science or nature is what it was back when Watson and Crick published their stuff and, and, and before. I think that those journals have, you know, are just outstanding and a lot of other journals are very good as well. I think the internet do, it does enable you to get information uh, about all kinds of things, but that doesn't mean that the quality of information is necessarily good. It could be in some cases. But the great thing about the top journals is the review process they go through and that ensures the quality most of the time. The internet, I think, has changed the ability of, of researchers in, in, well, internet and digital, changed the ability of researchers to do research. Um, linguists, for example, you know, are suddenly, with the digitization of back journals, able to look up things they couldn't in a way. Is it changing the ability of um, your researchers to sort of stay on top of 
different things or to find ways to do different things instead of just sitting in the lab and thinking about it and trying. They go online and say, oh, he's trying this or she's trying that. I think it helps you do searches. I think, I, I think it does help you find information faster, yes. Um, you've written a lot of articles, I guess over a about a thousand and thirteen books, and I guess some of these may be co-authored. Um, are any of them aimed at the public, or, or, and do you ever think about writing a book for a lay audience? Uh, some of the articles, I mean, I guess the question is how, how you know, like I've written a number of things for Scientific American and, uh -huh. place, and, and other places at that level. I mean, beyond that, I haven't. I mean, I, I guess I'm not sure that I'm really that great a writer. I mean, in fact, when I write for places like Scientific American or places like that, they always have editors or writers who take whatever I write and make it much more mm -hmm. understandable. Uh, but if there was a way I could help, I certainly would be happy to. Yeah. Are there any big popularizers in, in your field at this point? I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, the work somebody like a Steven Pink Pinker has done in terms right. of writing for a broad audience, or John Kenneth Galbraith in economics. Uh, yeah. I don't know if... I don't know if there are. I mean, I know what you're saying, I think, but I I, uh, I don't know if there are, is anybody that, yeah. that, that's, that's done that. You mentioned that you're about to, uh, I don't know if about, that you're going to be moving into the new Coke building and, and setting up how soon is that, and what's it going to look like, and will that change your your lab or your style at all because you're starting new? Uh, that's supposed to happen in you know a little less than a year from now, uh, in December of, of 2010. Uh, I don't think it'll change my style. I think it'll be a great thing. I mean, we'll get more lab space. We'll be in the same building with not only other engineers but you know some of the top biologists at MIT. So I think it'll be great for our students and postdocs to be in, in a place that's, you know, really going to expose them, you know, on a day-to-day -day or hour-by-hour -hour basis to, you know, really top biologists. And, and, and so I think that'll, that'll be a terrific thing. How much more space are you getting? Is it like a third more or half yeah, more? Yeah, maybe anything? it's, uh, I think we go from like 14,000 to 20,000, something like that. That's a big jump. Yeah, it'll be a big jump. We can Did use you have it. trouble filling it, or no. does everybody just get that much? Uh, they'll probably get that much more, but our, our our space is very crowded now. So they'll spread out. They'll spread out a little bit more. They'll probably. I mean, uh, you know, our, our our space is super crowded right now. <laughs> You'll hold on for another year. Well, well, I I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Did were you active in redesigning it at all, or did somebody else? carry that. I, I, I was involved in all the committees, but I don't want to give myself very much credit. I would give almost everybody else a lot more. I mean, so I was involved in it, but I, uh, mostly because they asked me to. I, I don't think that I contributed that much. And in terms of designing labs that, that facilitate discovery, were there other things that you said, we don't have this now, but it would be nice if? I don't Other know. than more space? Well, more space was the number one thing. And the number two thing really comes down to, to me, the ideas. You know, that, that, I mean, there are kinds of equipment that can accelerate discovery, like high throughput things. And, but we've gotten some of those anyhow, and hopefully that'll be accelerated in the new building. But to me, the number one thing is the people. And, and I think the, the increased interaction of people with very dis different disciplines, I think will be a terrific thing for helping, you know, new ideas and discoveries. There have been one or two um, reports about your work with Julie Andrews and her synthetic vocal cords. What, how's, how did that come about and where does it stand? Well, one of the, her surgeon, Steve Zytels, is at uh, Mass General Hospital and he, he asked me a number of years ago, could I help him because there's many people actually that have uh, vocal cord problems. Uh, Julie Andrews being one one of them, and uh, but she's herself been very helpful. I mean, she's been to our lab a number of times, and you know, helped helped in different ways um, in terms of creating awareness and even helping you know raise funds for it. Uh, so where we are is that uh, one of my postdocs has made a, a new gel, a new polymer that hopefully. Uh, 
could be in patients within a year or two or three. We don't know exactly how quickly. Um, but, you know, there have been animal testing now, and the hope is that it could be, you know, help for people who have scar tissue in, uh, in the vocal cords. Can you test vocal cords in animals? You can do some things in animals. You can look at some safety, and you can look at certain types of vibrations. Well, maybe we'll wait for her to sing at the opening of the Koch Institute. Well, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, it's my pleasure. Good luck.